We have a lot of different processes in our body ranging from our organ systems up until the cells that make up an entire being. And that is what physiology is all about. It encompasses the morphology, the structure, or even the anatomy of organisms, be it plants, animals, or even us, the mere humans. And speaking of body system organs, can I have Mark Jobeth to give me an organ system and its respective function or organ? Yes, Jobeth, go ahead. So, yung circulation system po and yes. one organ po is the heart that pumps the blood po all around the body. All right. First on our list is the circulatory system. The main organ is the heart that pumps blood towards the other regions of our body. And as we all know, heart is really important when it comes to pumping the blood because it enables us to function sending signals throughout our entire body. What about you, Stephanie Colleen? Aside from circulatory system, what organ system can you provide as well as its respective function or parts? Nervous system, sir, and the organ is the brain. Okay, we have the brain and the spinal cord that play a pivotal role in the stimulation or the different responses that our bodies could feel. That is one of the reasons why, as individuals, we are sentient. When we say sentient, we have the capacity to feel a sensation. And that is primarily because of our nervous system, wherein, uh, what do you call it? Neurons are specialized cells that give rise to these functions. Okay, thank you so much. Stephanie. Now, Gerald, aside from nervous system, what else do you have in mind? Go ahead, Gerald. Um, respiratory system. Po, yes. Tapos, yung lungs po, yung main organ po, for the Precisely. Gas exchange. So. Po. Okay. Gas exchange is the main function of respiratory system, wherein lungs is the most prominent part of it. Aside from what you guys have mentioned, we also have endocrine system and the parts or organs it encompasses are mostly our hormones. We have a lot of hormones present in our body. We have the sex hormones, namely androgen and estrogen. We also have the luteinizing stimulating hormone which is used by the feeding moms to their babies. We also have the growth hormones that can dictate the height, the weight of an organism which is also us human beings. To be honest, we have a lot of hormones that are present in our body but I will not be mentioning them all because it will take our entire time and we also have the renal system wherein kidney is the prominent part of it and as we all know the main function of kidney is that it is responsible for secreting waste materials in the form of water substance such as urine or the substance or fluid that you are releasing from your body every time that you take a piece or when you pee, right? So those are some of the examples of organ systems that are highly involved in physiology. I would like to point out everybody who is here right now that physiology is different from anatomy. Anatomy is the study of the structure of the body, while the physiology is the study about how those um, structures function what processes do they carry out with so that is it for physiology which is important in all living organisms especially in the field of biology you are going to be studying the various um, 
areas that physiology can deal with. We have the histology, parasitology, zoology, and many more. Okay, in relation to that, our bodies are kept internally balanced even though our outward atmosphere is always changing. The other word for outward atmosphere is external environment or the environment that is not involved inside us or the internal environment. It is constantly changing in a way that we cannot control. However, this process of constancy is known as homeostasis. Once again, you have heard of this term before, homeostasis. When you encounter or come across the word homeostasis, basically it is very crucial to the survival of all organisms. Homeostasis maintains a stability of all organisms despite of the harsh conditions that they might be in. Allow me to give you a great example. You, when you go to a cold place or let's say in Antarctica, the freezing, what do you call it? The weather is freezing cold, right? And that is where homeostasis takes place or occurs because you can maintain your heat inside your body. Now, let me ask you a question. Hypothetically, what do you think is the normal temperature of the human body? Go ahead, Rika May. Any idea what degree Celsius? Approximately what? Rika May, go ahead. Okay, Rika, are you here right now? What about you, Trisha Quizon? Approximately, what do you think is the normal body temperature of humans or other animals? Trisha Quizon. Saan? Saan? Okay, ano, ulit question. Okay, my question is, what is the normal body temperature of us? Temperature. 37, sir. Okay, precisely. That is a very well said answer. Just like what you have mentioned, Trisha, our normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. From the example that I have given you a while ago, when you go to a very cold place that has a freezing cold temperature, you can maintain your body temperature to normal because of the doing and responsibility of homeostasis. It allows us to have uh, stable body processes despite of the changes that is present in the external environment. So is it clear? Was I able to discuss what homeostasis is all about. Can you type number 11 if my discussion is precise and clear? All right, thank you so much for those who responded. Okay. <clears throat> thank you so much. Lastly, I would like to point out that homeostatic processes act at the level of the cell the tissue and the organ as well as for the organism as a whole. Apparently, we are talking about at a broader spectrum. Little do we know, everyone, that all organisms on this planet starts as a cluster of cells. And each cell has their own respective organelles that functions in many ways. From one cell to another cell, we become the tissue. And what do you call the study of tissue? Do you happen to know the answer, K and Mohika? What do you call the study of tissue, K and? Any idea? Histology. Okay, histology is the answer. And we have four major types of tissues. Connective, epithelial, 
muscular and nervous tissue. From that tissue, it will become the organ. We have the heart, we have the lungs, kidneys, brain, the list just goes on. Forming organ system, reproductive system, renal system, respiratory system, circulatory system, and many, many more. And that will comprise an organism as a whole. So basically, that is the interaction between physiology and homeostasis. Once again, just a breakdown. Physiology is the study of how the body functions in general. And when we say homeostasis, it is the ability of an organism to have a stable um, processes in their internal environment despite of the changes or harsh conditions they might be in under external environment. Take note of the words that I am using its harsh environment, being able to survive despite of whatever situation they are in. Okay. Let's now proceed to the three objectives that I have listed below for this topic. First and foremost, we are having this pre-lab discussion for us to recall the general properties, structure, and function of an animal cell. I am fully aware that it has been discussed to you by your previous instructor and allow me to bring that back this afternoon. Okay, second one, to review the concepts of homeostasis and the regulation of cell function in cell signaling. And lastly, for us to differentiate the types of cell transport, it could either be passive and active transport in animal cells and discuss how osmotic regulation works. So VS Bio 4-6, I am requiring your full attention for you to understand what I will be discussing in the upcoming few slides. Okay, let's talk about the anatomy and physiology of the cell. I know this is very common to us BS Biology students. We have to deal with the various organelles present in cells, be it plants, animal, or the human cells. But for this afternoon, we are going to be dealing with the anatomy and the structure of the generalized animal cell. I want you all to take a look at this illustration that we have here on your screen right now. I hope you can see what I'm presenting. This is the general structure of an animal cell, as we all know. It has a lot of organelles that perform a specific function and responsibilities that I will be talking about individually later on. We have peroxisome which is the spherical green, um, ob what do you call it, structure that are scattered all throughout the cytoplasm. We have centrosome, which is right over here. Centriole is located on this portion. We have lysosome, ribosomes that are embedded on its surface. The hair-like structure that you are seeing right now is what we call the cilium or cilia. Cell membrane is a structure that encloses the entire cell. And for the endoplasmic reticulum, it can be categorized into two. We have smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. The, um, the former is situated on the top region, while the latter is located at the bottom region. At the center of the cell, you will find nucleus which is divided into several parts we have the nuclear pore which is the holes scattered on the surface of the nucleus we also have the nucleolus we have the nucleoplasm and lastly the nuclear envelope and this structure that you are seeing right now that looks like bean shape is what we call the mitochondrion or 
mitochondria. The fluid portion of the cell is what we call the cytoplasm, specifically cytosol. And Golgi apparatus is right over here, which is sac-like in appearance. It has two compartments, namely cis phase and trans phase, which is comprised or confined in secretory vesicles. So that's it for the generalized structure and physiology of an animal cell. Okay, having said that, let's dive deeper and talk about the three main, main regions of an animal cell. We have the plasma membrane nucleus and lastly the cytoplasm. Now, let me ask you a question. Can I have um, Camille? What is the function of plasma membrane? It is also called as cell membrane. Do you happen to have any idea? Go ahead, Camille. Sir, cell membrane po functions as uh, protection po from, for the organelles or, or the components inside the cell. Okay. Very well said, Camille. Thank you for responding. The first major region of an animal cell is what we call the plasma or cell membrane. Just like what you have mentioned, Camille, it functions as the protection for the entire cell. We all know that an animal cell is susceptible to harm or damages. It is sensitive, it is delicate, and can be damaged very easily. That is why plasma membrane is very important for the maintenance of the various organelles inside the cell. I would also like to point out that a plasma membrane is semi-permeable, which means that it allows the entrance of molecules such as water and other ions inside the cell, but not all solutes. From the word itself, semi-permeable, it only selects what type of molecules can penetrate through the cell. All right, I hope that is clear okay for the second region of the cell is located on the center and that is what we call the nucleus any idea about the function of nucleus can i have genesis go ahead what is the function of nucleus genesis nucleus fosters the dna Okay, precisely. Thank you, Genesis, for your response. Yes, DNA is being stored or synthesized in the nucleus, but the main function of nucleus is that it regulates the various cellular activities that takes place inside the cell. And that encompasses glycolysis or even the Krebs cycle. But I would like to mention that Krebs cycle takes place in mitochondria, but still, nucleus has something to do with the entire process of the Krebs cycle. And like what I've said a while ago, nucleus is divided into several parts. We have the nuclear pore, which are the pores present on the superficial layer of the cell. The function of nuclear pore, same thing with the plasma membrane, it allows the passage or the exit of molecules, including water or soluble solutes, in and out of the nucleus. Basically, what I'm trying to imply here is that the nuclear pore is like the gatekeeper of the nucleus. Okay. It is followed by nucleolus, which is located at the medial portion of the nucleus. Nucleolus holds all the information regarding the DNA and the chromatin. It has to do or it deals with the genetic modification or genetic code. So that is the function of nucleolus. It holds chromatin and our DNA. The fluid portion of the cell, I, rather the nucleus, is what we call the 
nucleoplasm, wherein that is where nucleolus is being suspended. And lastly, the superficial layer of nucleus is what we call the nuclear envelope. As the word implies envelope, it covers or envelopes the entire nucleus against further damages. So that is it for nucleus. And for the last region of cell is the fluid portion of it is cytoplasm, particularly what we call the cytosol. The function of cytoplasm is really crucial for the entire cell because it is responsible for organizing all the cellular structures that you are seeing right now. All organelles are suspended or floating in the cytoplasm. So imagine class, if there is no cytoplasm, these organelles that you are seeing right now will not be able to be held in place. They will be scattered in a very disorganized way. It's all thanks to cytoplasm that they are organized in a very orderly manner. Again, that is the function of cytoplasm, keeping all the cellular organelles held into place. Okay, I hope that is clear. For the other organelles present inside an animal cell, we have the peroxisome, which functions for the metabolism of the cell. And basically, this is their shape. They are spherical in structure. What about centrosome? Centrosome plays a super important role in cell division, specifically mitosis. They can move towards the opposite pole of the cell, which will give rise to daughter cells. And it has to do something with the centriole. When we say centriole, basically these are the skeletal system of the cell, keeping them organized. If you are going to take a look at the structure of the centriole, they are tubular, comprised of proteins such as actin and myosin. That is the function of centriole, the skeletal system for the animal cell. Lysosome, on the other hand, are affixed on the wall of the cell. Lysosomes are composed of hydrolytic enzymes that can devour macrotubules, which can be destroyed by these enzymes that are comprised of high pH level. So basically what I'm trying to say here, lysosome can fight or destroy foreign bodies or materials that can penetrate through the cell. It's like the suicide bag, as what they call it, lysosome. Ribosomes, on the other hand, these are the proteins that are being synthesized in the nucleolus. And apparently, they are located at the top portion of the lysosome. The hair structure that you are seeing right now is what we call the cilium or cilia, which propels the entire cell for locomotion. Okay. And we have endoplasmic reticulum can be divided into two types. We have the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what is the difference between SER and RER? What about you, Clarice? Do you happen to have any idea about their difference? S -E yes, Pastor. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yung sa ano po, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum po, uh, meron pong mga nakatouch po sa kanya na mga ribosomes mo po. Meanwhile, yung sa smooth endoplasmic reticulum naman po is usually po wala po. Yes, exactly my point. Thank you so much, Clarice, for that very well said explanation. Basically, the main difference between SER and RER is that the former, there is no attachment of ribosomes on its surface. And as you can see on your screen right now, its texture is smooth, hence its name, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is the opposite of rough. 
apparently there's a lot of ribosomes that are embedded on its surface making them feel or look as if it is a rough so that is the logic about it a smooth no presence of ribosomes and for the rough there is the presence of ample amount of ribosomes and of course the famous cellular structure or organelle is what we call the mitochondria by which it's been defined as the powerhouse of the cell yes that is the main definition but we have to go further than that aside from mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell it also functions as the site of atp production when we say atp it stands for adenosine triphosphate which is being converted into energy that allows cellular processes to take place or to trigger that is the main function of mitochondria and that like what i've said a while ago krebs cycle takes place or occurs in mitochondria particularly in the mitochondrial matrix all right we also have golgi apparatus which is derived from the cyanus camillo golgi golgi apparatus can also be called as golgi complex or golgi bodies the function of Golgi apparatus, this is where the modification, the transport of proteins takes place. Like what I've said a while ago, it has secretory vesicles comprised of cis phase and trans phase. So that's it for the three major regions of an animal cell. Is it clear, everyone? Was I able to discuss it in a way that you have been able to understand it? Can you type number 30 if it's clear? Thank you so much for your response. Proceeding to our next slide is the components of plasma membrane. It can be divided into lipids and proteins. Okay, let's discuss each one of their functions individually. Like what I've said a while ago, plasma membrane has phospholipid bilayer and ample amount of proteins attached on its surface. Let's talk about the lipid bilayer. It can also be called as phospholipid bilayer and as you can see, it is very numerous in number. It has head and tail. The head part is hydrophilic, while the tail part is hydrophobic. When we say hydrophilic head, it is water-loving, which means that it has the ability to be dissolved or mixed with the water. And that is the opposite of its tail, which is hydrophobic, water-fearing, from the word itself, phobia or phobic, it has no capability to be dissolved or mixed with the water. Because I would like to mention that the plasma membrane is very delicate. It's vulnerable to all the damages. And it's all thanks to lipid bilayer that it can withstand such phenomena. Okay. As you can see on your screen right now, there is a lot of proteins present in the plasma membrane. But the two important proteins is what we call the peripheral and integral protein. I know that you have come across this with your first activity, but let me define each one of their function. Peripheral protein is soluble to water which means that it can mix well with them. It is embedded on this portion and it is much smaller in size as compared to the integral protein. One thing that you guys should be noting of regarding peripheral protein is that it cannot be dissociated away from the plasma membrane. When we say dissociation, it is the process wherein a particular object can be removed from 
where it is attached to. But in this case, peripheral protein has a difficulty dissociating from the plasma membrane, which is contrary of the integral protein. Integral protein is insoluble in nature, which means that it has no tendency to be dissolved with water. And aside from that, integral proteins um, can dissociate or can be removed from the plasma membrane. Apparently, it is much bigger in size. What about the channel protein, which is situated or sandwiched between peripheral and integral protein? The function of channel protein is like it is a transport protein. A channel protein pala can also be called as transport protein because it allows the passageway of ions and other foreign bodies in and outside of the plasma membrane. And it is very evident that the size and the width of the channel protein is much bigger as compared to both peripheral and integral protein. Okay, let's discuss the other two proteins that are present on the plasma membrane. We have the glycoprotein, which belongs to glycerol group in the chemistry. And for the globular protein, as the word implies, globular, they are, um, what do you call it, spherical in shape, embedded on the surface of the plasma membrane that perform a specific function. And for the glycolipid, which is a structure that is protruding from the superficial layer of the plasma membrane, it has a lot of function. It can function in multiple ways. It allows the metabolic rates that occurs in the plasma membrane. And for the carbohydrate, its main function is that it is covalently attached to amino groups. And lastly, for the cholesterol, basically it is the buffer which neutralizes the solution that can pass or penetrate through the plasma membrane. Aside from that, the other function of cholesterol is that it also is responsible for the maintenance or the organization of the entire structure as well. So I hope I was able to explain that very clearly. So that's it for the plasma membrane. And now let's proceed to homeostasis, which is the main topic that we are going to be dealing for today. As you can see on your screen right now, it is said that homeostasis is the state of steady internal physical and chemical conditions maintained by living systems, be it plants or animals or us human beings. All of us undergo homeostasis. It's like a mechanism that allows us to become stable despite of the external environment that we are in. From the example that I have given a while ago, the normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Once it exceeds that, homeostasis can still maintain our living body systems, making it turn to 37 degrees Celsius once more. And how do we maintain homeostasis? It can be maintained in many ways. First and foremost, we have to control our variable which is exemplified on your screen right now. Apparently, there is the imbalance when it comes to our variable. It could either be too much or too little. So what we have to do right now is we have to maintain the balance or let's say the equilibrium for us to retain or maintain homeostasis in our body. Okay, homeostasis is also dependent on three mechanisms namely receptor control center and lastly what we call the effector and allow me to discuss each one of these mechanisms one by one let's talk about receptor first as the word implies 
receptor. It can also be called as the sensing component of homeostasis. The main function or let's say the responsibility of receptor is that it is responsible for monitoring the different changes that takes place in the internal and external environment of all organisms. It can monitor whatever is happening or taking place. And what about the control center? When we say control center, it can also be called as the integration center. Again, integration center, which means that it receives the information or data from the receptor. And lastly, effector, it gives commands to the control center. It is the one that processes whatever is being sent to from the integration center that we have here. And to further elaborate on that, allow me to discuss this. For the process, step number one, we have the stimulus, which produces change in variable. When we are talking about variables, these are the various conditions that we have in our body. Aside from temperature, we also have variables such as blood pH, blood glucose concentration levels, or even the control of childbirth to moms or to the mothers. And stimulus can be defined as some end that gives rise to a particular reaction or mechanism. It will now undergo homeostasis and for the second step, change can be detected by receptor and once it is being detected, it can either be input or output. The former, that is where the information sent along different pathway, while the latter or the output, information sent along to efferent pathway. And for the last one, it will now undergo effector, wherein response of effector feeds back to influence magnitude of stimulus and returns variable to homeostasis, giving rise to the equilibrium of the body systems that we have us. So what I'm trying to insinuate here is that homeostasis is very important for us to survive on a daily basis. Imagine class, if there is no homeostasis, definitely we will not be able to survive. It's a mechanism that is being utilized by many organisms on this planet. I would like to mention that if there is a failure of homeostasis, it can lead to diseases illnesses or in the way, worst case scenario it can lead to death or pagkamatay and there are many factors to be considered that affects homeostasis first is our genes of course we all vary when it comes to our genetic material and code second one is our diet or let's say nutrition third one is the toxins and venoms that can penetrate through our body. So those are the various factors that can really significantly affect the rate of homeostasis. Okay, I hope it is clear. So having said that, homeostasis has something to do with both positive and negative feedback that I will further discuss in the remaining two slides that we have here. Let's talk about positive feedback first. It is a process in which the body senses a change and activates mechanisms that accelerates or increase that change. Take note of the word I have used, increase, amplification, basically the function of positive feedback loop is that it is a feedback that amplifies a response until a certain point is reached. And here are some of the examples that is being controlled by positive feedback. It includes the childbirth of the young moms, let's say, as well as the blood glucose level. So it will amplify the reaction until it reach a certain point. 
So that is what positive feedback is all about. It is the one that increases or change an output. Again, increases, amplify, intensify. Those are the key terms that are involved in positive feedback, which is contrary to negative feedback. When we say negative feedback or feedback loop, it is a feedback that reduces, okay, reduces or decreases a certain response to bring equilibrium, okay? That is the main difference between the positive and negative. The former increases while negative decreases or reduces a response. From the example I have given you a while ago, our body temperature is at 37 degrees Celsius. And once we get sick or we suffer from a fever, our body temperature rises in a way that we cannot control. It can reach up until 40 degrees Celsius. And that is where negative feedback takes place. It, it will bring down um, 40 degrees Celsius to our normal body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. So to further elaborate on that, kindly look at this structure um, that we have here. Let's focus first on the bottom portion of the image. We have the cold, which is a stimulus. And once we are feeling cold in our body, of course, our body temperature falls, right? And for the receptor, temperature-sensitive cells in the skin and brain is being triggered. And that is also one of the reasons why we are feeling cold inside of our body despite of the fact that we are generally warm-blooded um, species, okay? And as for the control center, there is the presence of thermoregulatory center in brain. And for the effectors, which is comprised of skeletal muscles, it can lead to shivering. When we say shiver, <coughs> my voice is getting hoarse. When we say shivering, it is a sensation wherein you shake unruly. You are having chills because of the cold stimuli that you have here, which is contrary to the heat or warm stimuli. When your body is feeling hot, of course, your body temperature rises, which is the opposite of the cold that falls. For the receptors, there is the presence of temperature-sensitive cells in the skin and the brain. For the control center, same thing as the cold stimuli, there is the presence of thermoregulatory center in brain. And lastly, for the effectors, it will have sweat glands, which will cause you to, pro to sweat profusely. Diba kapag mainit ng ating katawan, we tend to sweat a lot. So basically, that is the key difference between positive <coughs> and negative feedback that I am done discussing this afternoon. Just take note of these terms for the negative feedback decreases the output or the change. For the positive feedback, it increases the output or the change. So I guess that ends our pre-lab discussion for activity number six. I'm sorry, guys, for my voice. I am suffering from sipon, from a cold, <coughs> and I'm not feeling well, to be honest. I have to adapt my body to the changing weather here in Nueva Ecija because it's super in it here. It's super hot. But I'm happy that I was able to discuss our discussion.